Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Orletha, and I've been super looking forward to this day for a really long time because um, I thought it would be such an honor to be at AHS um, and have the scientific side behind it. So um, I'm, of course, going to tell you all about what I'm talking about. But first, I'd like to start with a story, because stories are always great, right? Everybody likes a story. Um, so. <laughs> About 12 years ago, I started following the paleo diet, maybe about 15 at this point, or I went paleo, as was the vernacular of the day. Um, and when I say I went paleo, I went paleo, like super paleo. <laughs> and I think a lot of people do that. But I read every single one of the books, like, and I think we've all read these lovely books, right? Listened to all the gurus, read all the blogs, and I became my own little paleo police, as I like to call myself. Um, so if it wasn't paleo, uh, if it wasn't grass-fed, grass-finished, organic, all the good stuff, um, then I wasn't going to touch it. Um, I had lost all of the weight that gastric bypass couldn't manipulate my genes into quite releasing. And I started getting uh, all of these people asking me, oh my gosh, how did you do it? You should write a blog. You should start a site. You should do all that. So of course, why wouldn't I? I mean, so I did that. Um, and I met lots of other cool paleo people, right? And so <laughs> I went to all the conferences. I went to all the paleo meetups. And shout out to Daryl Edwards, who's not here, uh, because that was probably the most fun I have ever had at a conference, right? Just running around in the grass and jumping on things. Who doesn't want to do that? Um, so <laughs> I did all of that. And um, you could say that I drank the paleo Kool-Aid. I was one of the cool kids, right? So. A little bit more into the paleo world than uh, probably most people, but I knew that something was off. Um, it's something I couldn't ignore. It was the tribe was missing something for me, and that is the warm hug of my grandmother's green beans and potatoes, right? But I couldn't have those because, oops, paleo's potatoes aren't paleo. Um, I couldn't also, I missed the, the warm, tender edges of her um, hot water cornbread. <laughs> but, couldn't have those either because, oops, grains. And then there was the soul that was her black eyed peas. And I couldn't have those either because legumes and lectins, you know, all the lectins. Um, and in fact, it was kind of missing any semblance of me. It was missing my heritage. It didn't have my tribe in it at all. It had kind of been stripped down, like the list of foods that I could no longer uh, enjoy because they weren't approved. Um, so I found myself looking for those foods of my childhood um, that fed my soul, the parts that connected with me to my culture. Um, I also found myself knee deep in the mental torrent of uh, orthorexia, but I mean, <laughs> I was also finding that my lifestyle was taking a toll on me physically um, and emotionally. My skin was a wreck. Anyone who has ever had an autoimmune issue, um, knows that it's no fun to be stressed, but my eczema was a mess. And I also had um, urticaria, which is recurring hives. That's not fun either. Uh, and it would just keep coming on and off, no matter how compliant I would be. Um, and I would love to show you an image of that, but I photoshopped all of those so that it wouldn't look so bad. Uh, <laughs> those are all gone. I needed to maintain the healthy image, right? Um, and it was sort of not my unwillingness to take part and to be compliant. It was more that something was missing. Um, I would even venture to say that my uh, social connections were very damaged because I would not only take my own food to all of my social gatherings, but if the food wasn't up to my, my standards, I would intermittent fast. And of course, we're knowing that that's not really winning any, any friends when you <laughs> show up with your own food or don't eat theirs. Um, so it just wasn't willing, winning any popularity contests with that type of behavior. Um, so <laughs> I wasn't enjoying life, uh, but I knew that no one would know, really know that as long as like my super shiny exterior was um, looking all that great. But you didn't know what was going on on the inside, and that to me is super important. Um, and so I was smiling outside, everything was great, but what was missing was my heritage, right? So. Um, I decided to put my science degree to work um, since it was doing nothing but collecting dust at that time. Anyway, <laughs> because I was no longer teaching, I was at home with my kids. And um, uh, I dove into peer-reviewed studies. I was looking at journals trying to find um, anything that would show me 
what my heritage foods look like. What did they eat? What did um, what was healthy for them? What helped them to survive? Because there had to be something out there, right? Um, some nutrients of those foods, since these people had to survive the brutalities of slavery um, for decades and then more gross injustices, so there had to be something. But there was one study that I found, um, and there it is, <laughs> that kind of helped me, and it was kind of disheartening to find that. So I decided to embark on my own little um, in one study. And this 2010 study did give me some hope. Um, it was a starting place for my own in one. Uh, and searching for different patterns of practice and lifestyle and environment because, of course, it's more than just food. Uh, it's not just what we're putting in our mouths that make us healthy. It's a holistic approach. I know a lot of times we spend a lot of time uh, focusing on macronutrients and micronutrients and all the good stuff of science, but there are some things that can't be quantified by science. And so that was also what was studied uh, here in this study and thought I would base mine on this. So these researchers, they studied um, the elders around the world for some wisdom and what has sustained them for so long. And among those elders were my elders, which is the West African elders. So yeah, good idea. Let's talk to people who actually made it to old age, <laughs> their mental, physical, and spiritual health intact, and what did they do to get there? Um, that's a great idea. So I thought, let's, let's do that. I mean, that's kind of why we're all here, is ancestral health. Uh, so what they found was grouped into three major categories. The first one was philosophy, attitude, um, and outlook. And that's kind of your mindset, how you see things, when, how you deal with problems when they occur, and your outlook. And then the second one was lifestyle practices. Um, and then lastly, they dealt with dietary and nutritional practices, which we get a lot of. So, these elders demonstrated a really comprehensive but simple set of practices that I think can enhance our own vitality and promote sustainable longevity, which is, I think, what our, the goal is. So in essence, the practice of wisdom of our longest living elders, it promotes the spreading of healthy lifestyles by following uh, traditional ways of taking care of the body, the mind, and the spirit. So again, I use this as a super simple framework for my own in one experience, uh, experiment. <clears throat> now, if I'm to be honest, philosophy, attitudes, and outlook are not something that we really discuss um, a lot of when we come to these conferences or any conference. I mean, when was the last time you heard somebody give a talk on, I don't know, focusing on being present or uh, <laughs> how it affects your mental health? So we really don't hear those things. For the most part of the wellness movement, I think, and this is my opinion, but I think it's based on fear. Fear of not getting sick, or sicker if you're already sick. Fear of eating the wrong foods. <laughs> fear of moving the right way or not moving the right way. Or fear of, you know, oh my God, looking good naked. I've heard that a million times. Um, so that's kind of what we kind of base our, our actions on. Uh, but studies have shown that our DNA, of course, is, we all know about epigenetics, but our DNA is controlled by signals that are outside of our cell. So in other words, the cell's environment matters much more than you know, what we might think. Um, the cell wall we know, is selectively permeable, so that means it selects what it lets in and what it lets out. And those selections, what it chooses to let in and let out, is really based a lot on the environment that that cell is in. So what's really, I think, really fascinating about that is that those signals, those thoughts, what tells that cell to, hey, let this in, don't let this in. Um, those are thoughts, that philosophy, attitude, and outlook. So if you have a terrible outlook, terrible philosophy, terrible attitude, um, then those, those attitudes, those thoughts, those feelings actually do <laughs> affect our cells. So if you have a terrible uh, thought about a specific food or food group, for instance, it can affect the way that your cells process that. Um, and I thought that was really interesting that those ancestors believe that the balance of mind, body, and spirit, not just what we're eating, the balance is what was essential to well-being. A lot of times we focus on one piece and not the rest, um, and that that intimacy with nature is profoundly important. So outside of the fields of slavery, for instance, my ancestors were looking for ways to lead a stress-free lifestyle, looking for ways to rest, 
because rest is super essential to this other piece of our philosophy, our attitudes, and our outlook. Um, it is <clears throat> essential to surviving and finding ways to relax and enjoy your life is very much a part, should be very much a part of your day-to-day -day activities. Our ancestors, my ancestors focused on living in the present and didn't dwell too much on the past. And they didn't spend too much time worrying about the future because that breeds anxiety. Uh, there was a belief that being in the present actually made way for the future. Uh, they didn't operate based on that fear that a lot of us tend to operate on. And even though their reality was grotesque, to say the least, uh, they were hopeful about the future. And they, pronounced, they had a pronounced resiliency about them. They had an obvious respect for community. Um, and so their peers and elders and leaders, and including nature, um, and life in general, they had a respect for that community. They had a community care was very big, high on the list of things to um, do <laughs> and, and take care of. Uh, they knew that in order to be healthy, the mental, spiritual, um, and um, not just physical health was important for all members of the community and it needed to be kept at the forefront. Um, they respected community. They respected it from a web of life perspective in that we're all connected and what affects one affects all. Uh, the perspective was observed throughout the history of Africans in America. The elders collectively were peaceful and they treaded lightly giving thanks and representing all life. They always had passion and purpose, no matter how simple it seemed. The physical, mental, and spiritual health of all members of the community was a community concern. And they knew that disregarding any of those pillars, any of those, was similar to having a tripod with just one leg and it can't stand, right? So we can focus on one thing, but it's just not gonna be successful. Uh, with this information in hand, I decided to focus uh, my, the part of my little experiment on the philosophy, attitudes, and outlook of my ancestors. And so I was raised, obviously, with respect for my community and never departed from those teachings. So I chose to focus on adding life to my years and not years to my life, not just, you know, adding years to life, um, which is a nice little quote that I found. I was like, oh, that's kind of cute. Uh, I'll throw that in there. <laughs> so that was the goal for which uh, my ancestors strove is to add life to years. Um, and so what I did to do that is I got rid of my alarm clocks. Yes. Um, <laughs> I changed my schedule so that it would begin after my morning meditations. So when the previous presenter was talking about breathing, that is definitely one of the things that I have totally incorporated was because it definitely changed part of my lifestyle. I also switched a lot of my high intensity trainings um, for walking and playing with my kids um, and gentle stretching to reduce a lot of the stress that was in my life. I know a lot of people can't do that, but totally what I did. And the ancestors, in order to uh, stay alert mentally, this part of their lifestyle practices, I think a lot of people can do. So there was a lot of um, reading and memorization um, and joking, and I love the part about the memorization earlier, um, and singing and playing music and storytelling. And I practice this with my own, in my own life by telling, having, we have a weekly story night um, at home and we retell stories of the week or our favorite adventure when we went out on a vacation or our favorite memory of my grandmother who's no longer with us. And it helps us to retell those stories and it helps our children to um, understand that it's very much more than just the memorization, but it's more about connecting as a community because again, we are all connected and it is more than just one. So this quote from Robert Waldinger, I'm not gonna read it to you because I think you all can read, um, is the director, he's one of the director of the world's longest running studies of adult life. Um, and it's, he's evidence that the elders were definitely onto something. Uh, they were deeply involved in this community aspect and they were connected, they were rarely lonely. A lot of times, um, I think we kind of take the food thing as let's just eat these specific things, but we don't understand that there is a human connection in food and being connected to each other and sharing a meal with someone and actually making eye contact and having those conversations is part of um, our community. 
And this is what uh, definitely I, I learned a little bit. And it's, again, why I partake in storytelling and telling to the younger generations and sharing with my community. Because it's not just about a meal, but it's about the um, exercise that stretches your mind. It's about the exercise that keeps your uh, mind active, but also those traditions alive. Right? So I retell the stories of my family and, again, pass on those traditions like um, you know, family stories and beloved recipes and cooking in the kitchen with my kids. It's part of our connection. Um, and speaking of recipes, yay, food. Um, I'm sure we could all agree that traditional diets are the best. Uh, and studies repeatedly demonstrate that those are the best diets for us. But whose tradition are, whose tradition are we talking about when we look at these? Whose ancestors, um, frankly, the diet and nutritional practices of my ancestors have been studied in the wellness community is little to none, and it's pretty much not there. Um, and so the book that I, were widely pronounced that I was studying, I was telling you about, that were the gold standard um, in the community really didn't include uh, my specific ancestors. So I kind of had a really hard time trying to sort of piece together the dietary and nutritional practices um, of my ancestors, which are obviously from Africa. <laughs> I know it's a shocker, but it's true. <laughs> I know, I know, you guys are like, <gasps> but you know, <laughs> they are from Africa. Um, here's my 23andMe report, which is kind of tiny, but um, I'm 88% West African. Um, and so I, the other 12%, as I don't think you can see it, but the other 12% is made up of 10% European and 2% Asian and indigenous. And so I started to think, okay, why am I di basing my dietary practices? Yes, on great, they're on traditional people, but which traditional people? I'm basing mine on 10%. And so I needed to switch those things around, and that's exactly what I did. I, didn't no, I no longer wanted to ignore the 88% of my genetic makeup um, in my dietary practices. So what I did is I dug into, <laughs> Gosh, this was really hard. I dug into uh, the dietary nutritional practices of my ancestors, but I had to like do a whole lot of research because it was really not easy to find a lot on the specific areas that I am from. And so I scoured the internet. I did find some really great resources. This one uh, from Old Ways was uh, the African Heritage Diet Pyramid, and it is based specifically on West African diet. And so what I did is I discovered that many of the foods uh, that were brought here on those slave ships uh, and how they were adapted to give them the nutrients that they needed to survive all of the brutalities that they were about to go through. Um, I learned that they enjoyed many of the foods that I thought were terrible um, and that had been vilified, uh, but I decided I'm going to bring those back in. And some of those foods are like peas, uh, tubers, which are okay now, beans, uh, peanuts, and oh my gosh, grains. That's like a curse word. I know, uh, <laughs> but some of the grains that I enjoy are Fonio and Amranath, you know, some of the ancient grains. It's not, I'm not telling you to go out and have a, a slice of, or, or, I mean, you can have pizza if you want, but it was not <laughs> included in the African heritage diet. Um, so they knew how to process these foods uh, so that they would have the most nutrient densities. For instance, soaking grains and soaking beans, right? And I knew that because my grandmother taught me how to do it back when I was a little girl. And her mother and her grandparents taught her how to do it. And so it's been passed on in tradition. Um, and I knew this. And so I was like, why did I say that these were terrible, right? So um, I knew that they had been processed the right way um, because, again, they had given all of the nutrient density to my people for centuries. So the West African diet, as you can see, is not centered uh, around heavy meat. It's centered around leafy greens. Uh, that's, the, that's the base of the pyramid. And then a lot of vegetables and grains, and then even more uh, greens. <laughs> Those, that's actually just a different type. I know it's really hard to see. But the, the biggest meat, the biggest protein source is fish. Um, and I absolutely love fish. If I, if I were to listen to my, my body, I would probably be a pescatarian because I love fish. Um, and then a little protein and some, some oils up there and dairy. And then at the very tippy top, sweets. But we know, I learned today, don't eat those first, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> but this is, is the typical African diet, um, like I said, from my ancestry and what I was able to, to find. 
Um, and then, so uh, here's what I did for my experiment. The first thing I did was to include those traditional foods, right? And then here's the hard part. I tracked everything. Um, so I tracked all of my results. The pandemic, of course, gave me a lot of extra time to uh, track that, <laughs> those results, especially over the last year. Um, and so I used a lot of my grandmother's recipe books. I used her mother's recipes and I found a lot of foods from, uh, I ordered these really great traditional grains, which I thought I would never be able to find, but I was, and I, I incorporated those into my diet. And what I learned over time was kind of, I think, eye-opening for me, uh, especially having been uh, so ingrained in, in the things that I should not have had. Uh, I thought, oh my gosh, this is going to be terrible. My numbers are going to look a hot mess. But what really happened was that my body loved every minute of it. Um, my health markers improved vastly. My sleep, um, I went from about maybe five to six hours of sleep um, to about seven to eight hours of sleep. And of course, I don't have an alarm clock, but I didn't have one when I started either. So my quality of sleep has been better. Of course, we have all these bio trackers, so I can actually see that this uh, number has improved. Uh, but also my blood pressure has improved. Um, it was, my, my numbers were all over the place, but they have improved vastly. And then I said goodbye to inflammation, which I think is great. Oops, I went the wrong way. I said goodbye to inflammation, and what I mean by that I'll get right back over there, give me one second. There we go. Um, is that my skin, like I told you, was a hot mess. I was covered in eczema. My eczema was flared so badly that it had turned black because it had died. Most of my skin had died. And then I was plagued also with urticaria, which is chronic hives. And I haven't had uh, an episode, a flare of chronic hives in probably a good seven months, which is to me, pretty amazing. And as you can see, I don't have to Photoshop my hands <laughs> this time. So that's definitely a plus for me. And then finally, the hair that was falling out when I was uh, very strict um, was has also grown back. And it grew back, not just back, but it grew back thicker. Yay. Um, so to me, like I said, I've incorporated these other aspects of those food aspects of my elders wisdom, but I also incorporated the other aspects, like, you know, not being a jerk about what kind of food <laughs> you take to social situations. And so my community relationships have improved. Um, and I think also importantly, my own body um, image has benefited greatly from this process. And what I know is that we're all beautifully different, right? And that's perfectly fine. I realize that we're not all meant to look exactly the same in order to be healthy, that health does not have a look. Um, I realized that not only do these, feeds, these foods feed my belly, but they fed my soul, and my soul was starving for the foods uh, of my ancestors, the food that I had banished from my queendom uh, because they had been deemed bad by all of the well, good wellness uh, gurus. So finally, here's my takeaway for you. Health is not, this heritage and health is not a either or situation. You can either have some of your heritage or you gotta be healthy. It is a both and situation. So you can explore the foods and the traditions of your culture and be healthy. They both fit in. You don't have to pick one or the other. This is definitely a both and lifestyle. Um, so here's your, your mission, should you choose to accept it. <laughs> I've always wanted to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm going to put that in because it sounds cool. I would be a Bond girl. Um, but <laughs> I would like to encourage you to look at how your heritage might be missing from your current wellness practice. And if you're like, well, I don't have any heritage, we all do. You can go all the way back, even if it's just something that you did with your grandmother over cooking. Because again, it's not just about the food, it's about the traditions and the connection. And so did, did you do something that you've eliminated? Is there something that is missing now that you've, you know, that or some food that was excommunicated from your clean eating lifestyle? For me, it was definitely my grandmother's hot water cornbread, which was, you know, I missed it. And so <laughs> I brought it back. Um, do you have a tradition that you're missing? Bring that back, tuck it in. Um, I would also like to encourage you to experiment to feed your soul 
and discover your own path to enhance and produce or promote longevity for you. Because we're all different, we're all unique. Your heritage is different. And unlike you might have been told by some uh, guru, <laughs> which I have heard this before, you actually are a unique snowflake. We all are. Um, and lastly, I would like to encourage you to share your findings with the world. Remember, storytelling is good for us. We learned that today. And just as in nature, um, like we learned, diversity only makes us stronger. And so make sure that everything that is different, you do share with us. We'd all love to learn. At least I would. So thank you so much. This has been great. <laughs>
Area Files. H R H R E F S. What is it then? I thought H it was H-R-A-F. 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 Sorry. <laughs> F's. H R A F. Sorry. Area. Yes. A E for me. <laughs> I have a question. Yes. Um, your eczema you talked about, did you figure what the triggers were and then what the uh, um, remedy was when you kind of dietarily? Yeah, so just as any other um, presentation of disease, it, there is always something underlying, there's always a cause. And for me, it was multifaceted. It wasn't just what I was eating. Um, I had been on, and I'll tell you how terrible my eczema was, I was actually admitted to Mayo Clinic for a month because it was that infected. So it wasn't just like, oh, it's bad, I have a rash, it was terrible. And so stress was my biggest, um, biggest trigger. I realized that once I was able to stop having um, these jolting alarm clocks, <laughs> stop having, uh, missing my sleep, um, eliminate a lot of the stressors of actually trying to follow um, a very, very dogmatic diet. When I sort of relaxed that a little bit, uh, it relieved a lot of the stress. When I uh, walked, I found that not exercising as hard as I was was actually causing flares for me. So when I was doing the hardcore like CrossFit, I was breaking out in hives. So I, ha I would have a flare. And so for me, it was the stress, more than one stressor, but for me, it was stress. And then when I changed my diet to include the other foods, um, it still, it cleared up. So it wasn't necessarily including the other foods 100%, but it was more stress for me. One other thing was I just uh, come across High on the Hog, the book. Such a good book. Which opened up so many things. And we ran into the chef at the farmer's market out here who was doing the uh, reenactments of the presidential That's dinners so that awesome. they had done. Yeah, the macaroni and, and cheese. Uh, <laughs> so I'm excited. Next week, the hog head that's sitting in the... Uh, I'm going to do my first uh, head cheese one of these That's days. so awesome. But every time I open the freezer, it's still there <laughs> communicating. Check out the, uh, the Netflix special, too. It's also really good. They've renewed it for a second season, so... High on the hog is what he was saying, and it's really good. Thank you for that. Yes. So, um, my question is, um, and maybe it's for everybody to ponder, but uh, for you specifically, how did you determine, and I think I know the answer, I think you explained it, but how do you determine where to define ancestral? And, you know, I think for myself, I'm, I've been exploring the hundreds of thousands of years or millions of years prior to agriculture. And I consider, for me, for my learning process, that's my ancestors. And of course, we all began in Africa, but um, long before, you know, the the splitting off and 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 how agriculture has has influenced the the human body and then the modern day and all of that. So I guess my question is, how do you decide what ancestral is? And I think it's for you, it's culture and what relieved that stress and congratulations. That's, Thank you. that's a lesson for everybody is to not, is to find your path, what works for you. And it's not gonna work for everybody else, but. I agree, and that's exactly what uh, culture is or, and how you find, define your ancestry is your ancestry. And some of us, of course, will have overlap Right, we're gonna have some. Some of us are have the same things that that work well. For instance, we none of us need to make a diet based on donuts and like like we just don't. That's not good for anyone. <laughs> However, you know, saying that some people no one ever needs to eat rice is something that we can't say as a bl blanket statement. Some people do need to incorporate rice. Maybe it's better for them. Maybe they feel better. And so I would like to encourage you. Yes, find the framework, but find your particular path in that framework because we're all different. And even though we all want to have an easy way out, like, yes, let's all do this one thing. It's not easy. It's not going to work for everyone. You still have to do the work yourself. You have to, we can, we can listen all day, but you still have to plug it into your life and make it work for you. Sorry. <laughs>
cherish the not being able to uh, utilize that so much? Do you notice with your family or anything that that's kind of put a damper on? Well, so <laughs> the cool thing about, you know, being a, a technical family, a techie family, my husband's super techie, is that we were still able to connect. Obviously, everybody and their mother was on a Zoom meeting. How many people did not have a Zoom meeting with your, like, everybody had a Zoom meeting? Right, so <laughs> we had like Zoom, uh, we had a Zoom family reunion, for instance, last year. My grandmother, I lost both of my grandparents during the pandemic, and so we couldn't really go to see them, which was really hard for us, but we did, we were able to connect. We had a, a virtual can, candlelight visual, you know, so it's still ways to connect. Um, and I would, again, like to encourage everyone to connect to their community, because it's so healthy, and we, I think a lot of times we miss that. That's why we're here, right? Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you. Thank you. So we have a right now, we come back with our last presentation of the day at 4:20. So, you guys have about 14 minutes.